So it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sue Lanham New uh, to give this year's uh, BNF Prize lecture. Um, of course, Sue was the winner uh, of this last year, and part of the prize is the privilege of presenting a lecture <laughs> the following year. Um, Professor New is she is the head of the Nutritional Sciences Department and Professor of Human Nutrition at the University of Surrey. She is one of the stars of human nutrition research in the UK, and she's won many awards for her, uh, for her work in the field of nutrition and bone health in particular. This, of course, is currently an area of real importance due to the potential effects of poor nutrition on the risk of bony fractures. Most notable um, have been the awards from the Nutrition Society of the Nutrition Society Medal, and also leading the successful application by her department for the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Nutrition and Health. She's a member of the government's Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, and she's played a key role in developing advice on the need and provision of vitamin D. She's over 200 original research publications, including the first academic textbook of nutritional aspects of bone health. And as well as these professional commitments, she still has found time to bring up her lovely family, um, and she has two teenagers who are sitting at the back of the hall, one of whom she gets up at 5 a.m. in the morning for to take four times a week to go skating. I think it's absolutely above and beyond the call of duty, so really. Um, it's been, really been a privilege to follow her career over the past 20 years or so and watch her become one of the UK leaders in nutrition and a worthy winner of this year's BNF Prize Lecture. So we look forward to your lecture, which is entitled From Acids to Alkalis, Sunshine to Shadows, Reflections of a Journey in Nutritional Science. Susan Lanham, you. Mr. President, thank you very much for that most kind introduction. Honorary President, Director General, trustees, staff and members of the BNF, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Words cannot possibly capture how humbled I feel to have won the 2018 BNF Prize and to now be delivering the 2019 Annual Lecture. And so first and foremost, thank you so much to all of those of you who voted for me. And then secondly, thank you to all of you for coming to listen to my talk. I sincerely hope that by the time I get to the end of it, you will be able to look back and say that was a presentation that was befitting of an award from an organisation that has excellence at the heart of everything that it does. Now, I've given a great deal of thought as to how to plan this presentation. And what I'd like to do is to take you through a journey of nutritional sciences, through the science, and to begin with is to take you through the work that I've done on acid-base homeostasis and the skeleton, which I've captured in the title by Acids and Alkalis. And then secondly, all the work that I've done in the last 15 years or so on vitamin D, which I've captured here with respect to sunshine and shadows. And within my talk, I want to refer to a number of individuals who've really inspired me and for whom I shall be forever indebted. And I've, I hope that you'll think that I've got the balance right and you don't suddenly think that Eamon Andrews is going to walk through with his <laughs> red book for those of us who can remember that programme, This Is Your Life. So the way I've planned the talk, um, which I've done very carefully, is to take you through a whole range of different aspects. And Mr. President, I've got my um, stopwatch on me and I promise I will stick to the time that I've been given. See, there's so much to say, I could keep you here all night. Um, but I will make sure that I, I stick to my time. And what I want to do is to first of all take you through what osteoporosis is, because that is the field that I've worked in for over 30 years now and um, is, as uh, Professor Schenkin said, a very important health condition. Then you can't possibly talk about nutrition and bone without just referring to calcium and health, so I'd like to 
just, um, just talk a, a little bit about that. And then to get into all the work that I did in acid-base homeostasis and the skeleton, particularly refer to the early work and the mechanisms, but then also dietary acidity, and to finish with our uh, potassium salts meta-analysis. And then I'd like to go on to the field of vitamin D and health, and again talk about the, the early work and the vitamin D metabolism, and then cover all the work that we've done for the last 15 years or so at Surrey on vitamin D. And then to finish with um, some areas of further research that we're going on to do and some concluding remarks. And so I will absolutely stick to my time, but I'm hoping, Mr. President, given that we're ahead of schedule, you might just give me two or three um, extra minutes so that I can make sure that I cover all of it, um, and particularly with respect to those individuals who have really inspired me. So let's begin at the beginning. And of course, let's first of all define what bone health is and what osteoporosis is. So in the Greek word, of, of course, it is osteo, is bone and por porosis means porous, so osteoporosis, as defined by the WHO back in 1991, is indeed a skeletal disease that characterised both by low bone mass but also deterioration of bony tissue, which leads to this increase in susceptibility to fracture, with of course fracture being the end point. This is what um, the vertebrae, uh, third verte lumbar vertebrae of a 30-year-old woman looks like, and this is what it looks like in somebody who has osteoporosis. And if we just uh, home in on, on this section, just so that you can really see tremendous um, trabecular disconnectivity, this is the trabecular bone element that's been eroded by the bone cells. And these slides have been kindly lent to me by Dr. T uh, Professor Timothy Arnett. And then you can see it up even further closer here, where they've become perforated. Now, it is this uh, cell, the osteoclast, that is responsible for resorbing bone. And when you put that um, into the context, what we have is a process of bone turnover, both resorption by the osteoclast. So you can see here, this is an osteoclast that comes to the bone surface and it munches away a bone cavity. That is then uh, reversed by the osteoblast, the bone-forming cells that then migrate to the surface, fill in that bone, then mineralize it, and we go back to quiescence or resting. And that is a process that is continually ongoing for a whole range of different mechanisms within the body. And one of those, which I'd like to share with you, is the work on acid-base homeostasis per se. Now, this is a rather busy slide, but it's just to make the point that what you see when we look at markers of bone turnover and we look at bone, we have, first of all, in the green regulators of bone turnover that are identified here, and I don't have time to go into these, but these would be very much markers in which we try to target uh, pharmaceutical uh, trials to really look at bone agents. What we also have, of course, are the bone formation markers that we can measure, but then we have a much greater extent of bone resorption markers that we can measure. And in particular, bone is very much made up of type 1 collagen, and we have a range of different markers around uh, measuring uh, collagen attributes. And in particular, pyridinium and deoxyperidinolin um, are two markers, and I had the great pleasure of doing my PhD with Dr. Simon Robbins, who was the scientist who first identified pyridinium crosslinks as a valid marker for bone resorption. And when we look at this and we look at changes in bone mass with aging, what we see is, of course, first of all, we have attainment of peak bone mass, so what we're trying to achieve is as much bone as we can lay down in our bank in our early years to help offset the age-related bone loss that we will see with ageing, and particularly for women during the menopause, because of the loss of oestrogen, those osteoclasts become hyperactive, and we, make a, we lose a lot more bone than we can make. And when we look at osteoporosis as a public health condition, 
We have now over 3 million people in the UK who have osteoporosis. That equates to over 500,000 fragility fractures. Many of these fractures can be, could be prevented and are currently not. And when we look at the costs of these, they are extraordinary. 4.4 billion each year for fragility fractures. And when you add up all the costs that you see, 1.5 billion pounds per year would absolutely put osteoporosis on the same catastrophic map as other health conditions, even though it doesn't always get the same attention. Now, when we think about the one nutrient that we've always focused our time on, which is, of course, has been calcium. And so I can't possibly talk about nutrition and bone without just saying a few words about calcium. We have our blood calcium levels that are maintained within very narrow limits. And the reason that that happens is because we need calcium in our bodies for a whole range of different life-supporting activities, not least nerve and, and muscle function. And the way that the body does that is through a whole range of different mechanisms, particularly through the actions of parathyroid hormone. And so what that means is if we take a blood sample of an individual, we cannot tell what their calcium supply is. We can tell what their serum calcium is, but it doesn't tell us about bodily stores because it is homeostatically controlled. And so as a consequence, ladies and gentlemen, that has made setting calcium requirements very difficult. And these are two examples of calcium requirements in the USA and in the UK. And you'll see across the board that the UK have been lower than other countries. And it was once thought that actually the UK had set its calcium requirements a little on the low side. But I think it's been borne out that actually that LRNI for calcium, which is 400 milligrams per day, all the studies that have followed suit have shown that so many of the populations that have issues with osteoporosis is because they have a calcium intake less than 400 milligrams per day and that more isn't necessarily better. And so first and foremost, my first inspiring academic is Professor Anne Prentice. I've had the great honor to work under her for 10 years as our brilliant second chair. And I think of all the things that she's taught me is when you read a paper, go read it again, because you might actually thought that you read it, but actually you haven't read the small print. And what I think has been borne out, and we can see that here, that when you look at it's a very conflicting area, the calcium field, there are some systematic reviews, as this one by the New Zealand group, that suggests that calcium is not important, and then there, is, uh, there are others that say that it do, that it is. And we almost have, have as many randomized controlled trials, or we almost have as many meta-analyses as the randomized control trials could go into those meta-analyses. But for sure, what it's been shown is that low calcium intake is detrimental to bone. To add to that and to add to the complications that we see, there has also been quite a lot of work and analysis, particularly by the New Zealand group, talking about the cardiovascular complications of calcium supplements. And that has led to an explosion in the media of taking calcium supplementations is bad for health. That data, and indeed I've had some very interesting tete -tete tates with Professor Reed, because some of his analysis is based on data where the end point was not cardiovascular risk factors. And we have to be very careful not to make more of the data than, that, than what it was powered to do. That said, we also cannot ignore those findings. And I think what is is absolutely borne out is that if an individual can achieve their calcium through the diet, that is a much better route than taking a calcium supplement. But just to bring you right up to date, this is the new data literally uh, out last year from the UK Biobank, which is a huge cohort, over 500,000 um, individuals are within the cohort. And the Southampton group, led by Professor Cyrus Cooper, have looked at that. Uh, uh, they have a huge number of individuals, as you can see in the yellow. And what they find in this largest cohort ever looked at 
that there was no evidence of a link between calcium and vitamin D and cardiovascular risk factors. So we must look at that, but also treat any big claims with caution. Now, when we look at the Royal College of Physician guidelines, and I'm going to come back to this slide, but just to say that there is a, a very carefully thought through recommendation now of treatment of osteoporosis. And I shall not forget my um, training in nutritional sciences was undertaken at the University of Aberdeen. So my second slide, these gentlemen need no introduction in this audience. Uh, Professor Agat and Professor James were instrumental in setting up that programme and I was in the second cohort year of it and Professor Jackson was the external examiner and all three of them have been tremendously encouraging of me and women in general, uh, women scientists and nutrition scientists, to really explore the data and get answers. And I shall not forget when I finished my Masters and I went on to work in the Aberdeen Royal Hospitals, and I went to work with several clinicians, one of whom was this wonderful man, Professor David Reed, who has done so much for the Royal College of Physicians with respect to the guidelines. And I shall not forget when he asked me what I had done, and I said, oh, I've done an MSc in human nutrition. And he said, oh, yes, that's cooking, isn't it? And I said, actually, Professor Reed, it's a bit more than that. And by the time that I left his wonderful unit, I had really persuaded him that nutrition was was really, really key. And it's wonderful to see that on this Royal College of Physicians guidelines that we now have nutrition right across the board. So for example, if somebody presents with risk factor, they have their bone density measured, and whether, wherever they fall in the categories of normal bone, low bone, or full-blown osteoporosis, one of the treatment strategies is giving them lifestyle advice, which includes diet. And then, of course, if they are frail, they will be given a calcium and vitamin D supplement. And it's just wonderful to see that that is there. Now, before I go on to talk about acid base, I thought I would just take a moment just to say, because having finished, I did a degree in sport and exercise sciences and then was enthralled with nutrition. And I tried to reflect in preparing for this where my passion for nutrition had come from. And it came from three very unusual individuals, and I'm certain you won't know any of them, but I thought I would just take one minute to just share that with you. The first one um, is, um, and actually just before I say that, actually to just bear in mind that with regard to the guidelines for osteoporosis, which has been updated, protein is also included, but there's only one reference. But actually calcium and vitamin D are the only nutrients that are in there. And so just thinking about that and thinking about where my passion and, and interest came, it was from these individuals. So the first was this lady. I don't even have a picture of her, and indeed she is no longer with us. The only thing that I have is that a, a race was named after her because she was a very inspirational horsewoman. I started in horses. I was known as the Red London Bus Girl. I would get the red bus out very early in the morning from Mitcham to Epsom Downs, and I worked with her for about eight years and I learned so much about horses, and the bottom line was that nutrition was absolutely key in the work that she did to try and take racehorses to have other careers. The second person who I'm, again, I'm also certain you won't know, because I came from the London Borough of Merton, I was able to go for the Wimbledon Bull Girl trials, and I was successful in getting to be a Wimbledon Bull Girl in 1983. There were 12 Bull Girls and... Uh, 84 ball boys in, in that time. And we were trained by Jenny Archer, who was the coach to uh, David Weir, who I'm sure needs no introduction to you all. And again, nutrition was absolutely key in the training that she did. We had to go for trials for three months, and the training was for six months. You wouldn't think so much would go into to actually learning how to handle a, a ball, but it, indeed it did. And then the third person, and again, I don't have a picture, and he is no longer with us, but was this gentleman, Harry Wilson. I never had the privilege to be coached by him, but I would always observe the coaching that he did of the athletes at Crystal Palace. I moved from horses to athletics and um, spent quite a lot of time training and and competing. And again, one of the things that I observed so much from what he did was nutrition was absolutely key. 
And in his book, Steve Ovett, who of course won the 800 metres in the 1980 Moscow Olympics, he said how much Harry Wilson had advised him on the nutrition of what he did. Now, what I went on to do, having finished my master's, is to work in Aberdeen on the Aberdeen Prospective Osteoporosis Screening Study that was set up by Professor Reed, And it involved over 5,000 women within a 100-mile radius of Aberdeen, and nobody was looking at the nutrition of these women. And so I went to see Professor Reed, and together we wrote grants and were able to, to get some funding. And what we published was a paper in 1997 in which we showed a link between fruits and vegetables and bone health. We didn't capture that in the title, but um, as luck would have it, the, in 1999, the Framingham group, Catherine Tucker's group, showed very similar to what we had found, but in an older co cohort. And then working with Dr. Simon Robbins, we then looked at bone metabolism and again were able to show these differences uh, between women with respect to their fruit and vegetable intake. And this, because it was in the January issue of the Millennium um, issue, it even got into the New York Times and the Boston News. And what those studies did was very much looked at the link between fruits and vegetables. And I would just like to very much acknowledge uh, Professor Helen MacDonald, who carried on the APOS study when I was appointed at the University of Surrey. And the, the work of APOS was very much around showing this link and putting back the fruit and vegetable theory back into bone that had been there, but then had not been followed up. And in particular, which I'm going to come back to, we focused on looking at dietary acidity, particularly with respect to net endogenous acid production. I will come back to that because, um, in a little while. These two individuals, I think one of the reasons why the APOS nutrition cohort was, uh, gained a lot of attention was because we measured diet very, very carefully. And I was advised by uh, Geraldine McNeil and... Um, Caroline Bolton-Smith to assess diet and we adjusted for total energy intake and we dealt with the under and over reporters. Now when you look at it and when you look at the theory of acid-based homeostasis it very much comes down to, very similar actually to serum calcium, we have an acid-based pool and our body has to maintain, uh, blood, has to maintain our blood pH within very narrow limits. And it does that through a number of different mechanisms, through the lung, the kidney, but also through bone. And it, uh, the, if you look at that and you look at the history of acid base and bone, it goes back a very long way to the 1880s, as you can see here. As far back as the 1880s, the alkali bone mineral may play an important role in the defense of the organism against acid loading and acidosis. And then also in the 1960s, natural, pathological, and experimental states of acid loading and acidosis were associated with hypercalceria and a negative calcium balance. This was one, and I'm sorry that this slide looks a little old, but I wanted to just show you some real data from Uriel Barzell's group, who was very much the founding father of the acid base and bone story. And what he showed was that individuals on a, on a regular diet, when you then um, made them more acidic, that increased their bone resorption. But then, and that was uh, highlighted further by in, uh, using a low calcium diet, but then when you used alkali, what you did was you negated some of that bone turnover. And those were the very, very early studies that were done. And that led to a hypothesis paper by Vachman and Bernstein in The Lancet, which was an increased incidence of osteoporosis with age may represent, in part at least, the lifelong uh, utilisation of the buffering capacities of the basic sorts of bone against the constant assault of pH homeostasis. And they go on to say that it might be well worth um, following a diet that is an alkaline ash one 
which would, have of course, include a lot of fruits and vegetables. And when we look at that and we think of that in its context, it's perfectly acceptable to assume that we have a total body calcium content of about one kilogram. We need about two milli equivalents of calcium per day, per kilogram per day, to buffer about one milli equivalents per kilogram per day of acidity that we would eat in the Western diet. And so for over a decade, that could account for about a 15% loss in inorganic bone mass. And when we look at the mechanisms for the effect of acidity on bone, there is one. And it comes from two groups, David Bushinsky from uh, the, the America, who's shown that a, a direct enhancement of osteoclastic activity very much through a simple passive physical chemical exchange. And then uh, Timothy Arnett from UCL has shown and published in the same year as David Bashimsky's group that tiny changes in the extracellular pH close to the physiological range resulted in large but independent alterations in osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. And this is some of his data that if you lower that medium pH, your osteoclasts become hyperactive. And there is an on-off set button when that happens. And so there are mechanisms for an, uh, an effect. And so over the last 25 years or so, I've worked greatly with this individual, Professor Linda Frasetto, who is the, was the professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, and what she showed is that as we get older, we increase our acidity. So as shown here, blood hydrogen ion concentrations and plasma bicarbonate concentrations. And with age, as we get older, our hydrogen ion concentrations go up and our plasma bicarbonate concentrations go down. And so we become significantly more acidic with age. And the work um, of her, her mentor, Professor Antti Sebastian, who published, of course, the first paper, a proper randomized controlled trial on this, in the New England Journal of Medicine in the 1980s. What lends further to support to the acid-based story is, of course, the DASH trial. The DASH, as published first by Lawrence Apel in the New England Journal of Medicine, of course, was nothing to do with bone. But what they showed was that individuals on the high fruit and vegetable intake significantly reduced their urinary calcium excretion. And they write in the discussion, the unexpected observations were a prominent reduction in urinary calcium excretion. And they go on to say that they hypothesized that that may have been explained by the high fiber content of these two diets, which may have impeded calcium absorption. But Uriel Barzell follows that up with a letter to say that actually an alternative theory is that you actually reduce the acid load of the diet in those individuals in the fruit and vegetable component. Dr. Simon Robbins and I wrote to Lawrence Apel and his group to ask if we could measure bone turnover markers, and we were very sorry that they didn't have any samples left, but that was done in the second DASH trial that was published by Frederick Sachs, again in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the bone turnover markers were measured by Fiona Ginty and the team. And what they showed was indeed a significant reduction in bone resorption in that second DASH sodium trial. Now, there's always different uh, individuals with different uh, views. And not everybody shares that view that acid-based homeostasis and the skeleton is important. And indeed, Taris Fenton, um, wrote a, a very interesting paper where she applied the Hughes epidemiological criteria for causality and could not find an, an, an effect. And having discussed this greatly with uh, Professor Arnett and Professor Bushinsky, we came to the conclusion that that paper, whilst important to bear in mind, and I think what we lack, of course, are a large number of randomized controlled trials, but they make the group make very far-reaching unsupported judgments. They exclude a number of very key cohort publications, and there is almost a total disregard of the mechanisms of action. That said, 
We were successful, led by Professor Helen MacDonald, in getting a Food Standards Agency grant to look at um, potassium uh, citrate supplementation in the long term. And that was not, did not show a, a beneficial effect of long-term supplementation of potassium citrate and bone. And as a consequence, this study has made getting further funding in acid-based homeostasis very difficult. And I would just like to acknowledge very much that uh, Dr. Margaret Ashwell was the program manager for a number of our FSA grants. And, and having her wisdom and her thoughts on, on how we were doing those studies at that time, both Helen and I really, really appreciated um, her wise counsel. But we didn't show an effect with this larger study, but there are others that have. And in particular, the NIH in the US have funded a lot of trials on acid-based homeostasis, particularly with Best Dawson Hughes's group, for which they show a beneficial <coughs> impact, but for trials no longer than one year. Now, when we looked at our analysis, what we also did was to look at dietary acidity, and, and in particular, uh, the, the ratio between potassium and protein. And we looked at net endogenous acid production. Now, those of you of Scottish origin, NEEP, it has nothing to do with the turnip, but it's to do with your net endogenous acid production, which is basically can be captured by the amount of protein you consume over the amount of potassium that you consume. And what we were able to show was that those individuals with high acidity had either lower bone density or higher bone resorption. What we were not saying was that protein was bad for bone. And I was rather aghast to see so much of the literature was then writing that we were purporting that protein was bad for bone health, which, of course, we were not. Indeed, those subjects in the lowest quartile of NEEP actually had protein intakes well above the RNI. But I thought, oh dear, everybody's saying that protein is bad for bones, and they're saying we're saying it, and we absolutely weren't. And I thought very carefully, how do we address that? And so, as luck would have it, this young lady walked into my office to ask if she could come and do her undergraduate project with me. And so, with great guidance from Professor Joe Millward, We've published two huge meta-analyses and systematic reviews on dietary protein and bone. This second one is just out, and we um, have accumulated within that over 40 years' worth of data. And in both those studies, protein is good for bone. It is absolutely not. And um, Andrea was successful in winning the Royal Osteoporosis Society Young Scientist Award last year and then last month in Dublin, presented the Julie Wallace Award for all her work in nutrition and bone, including vitamin D. And so I cannot possibly give this talk without referring to this gentleman, Professor Joe Millward, who appointed me as a very shy young lecturer at the University of Surrey, to whom has been a great mentor. And in the same way that Professor Prentice has taught me to read a paper twice, he has taught me always what are the mechanisms and what's the bottom line and always know that if you're going to purport a theory, what is the mechanism behind it? And he remains, ladies and gentlemen, still the key advisor to the FAO, WHO, um, uh, on protein requirements, and was instrumental in writing both the DRVs for energy for SACN, and then more recently, the military DRVs. And I've benefited hugely from his wise counsel for over 25 years. And when you look at that, I think what's also great with the acid-based field is that there are other studies now coming out showing a link between dietary acidity and bone, including the, the Rotterdam study, including the EPIC study. But it's also starting to strain out into other fields, including diabetes, as I list here. And then, of course, the new SACAN Committee of Toxicity report of, a, of a, a focus now on replacing sodium um, enhancers with potassium-based um, salts, which may, in the long term, have a benefit to bone. What we've also gone on to do is to try and keep the acidity and bone story there, is to undertake a meta-analysis, because after a while we've had enough 
randomised controlled trials that have now been available. And so led by Dr Helen Lambert at Surrey, what we've shown in those meta-analyses is that there absolutely is a beneficial effect when you pull them all together, both for urinary calcium excretion and also for bone resorption. And Helen has been really instrumental in pushing this forward and that actually when you look at those potassium salts, they really do show a bone benefit. And what we now need to go on to do, and we're talking about fruits and vegetables that are high, and let's put that into perspective, some of our population don't, eat, don't even reach two portions per day, that actually what we now must do, because actually when you look at some of those trials, the reductions that you're seeing in bone resorption are really very extensive. In some of them, they are as good as the bisphosphonate drugs for osteoporosis. And now what we're going on to do is Helen will lead on a second meta-analysis because we have about another new eight papers, predominantly from the USA. Now, what I want to do is to now switch to vitamin D. And I tried to think, now, is there a link between dietary acidity and vitamin D? And the, there isn't. I haven't been able to find one. And the reason I moved into vitamin D was because my, it was very, became very difficult, particularly after that FSA trial, to get further funding in vitamin D. And so I made the switch. And I think the next two individuals, their bottom line to me would be, be prepared to change the direction in which you do when you're working in nutritional science and don't always stay within the same subject. And so Professor Judy Buttress, who I had the great honour of planning the first ranked forum on vitamin D that, uh, that uh, Professor Christine Williams was very supportive wearing her rank a prize funds hat. And we hosted that at Surrey. And we've gone on to, um, in September run, 10 years on from the first rank forum, is to hold a second one to really try and get the discussions underway. And that was co-chaired with both Professor Anne Prentice and Professor John Mathers, who I will come back to in a little while, as rank prize funds um, representatives. And those two individuals have really inspired me to make sure that you, you, when you need to change direction, change it. And when difficult funding becomes difficult, be prepared to, to do that. Now, one can't possibly talk about vitamin D without referring to Dame Harriet Chick, she was, of course, a hugely important scientist, British scientist to us, and she is best remembered for her Lancet paper for demonstrating the roles of sunlight and cod liver oil in preventing rickets. And when we think about vitamin D, it is, of course, not a vitalamine in the true sense of the word. It is actually a pro-hormone, and it is the only nutrient where our main source actually is not diet, it is actually UVB exposure. And the UVB exposure must be at this wavelength. And so what happens is we have 70 hydrocholesterol just under the skin, UVB rays hit the skin, and we go on to make vitamin D. And this is our marker for clinical status. So unlike calcium, we do have a very good marker for clinical status. Um, status, which is, of course, 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Giving that in a little bit more detail, so the UVB rays hit onto the skin, and so there must be a direct contact on the skin, so clothing and sun cream will, of course, block out uh, vitamin D manufacture. And then what we have is a temperature-dependent isomerization. The enzyme 25-hydroxylase in the liver then goes on to enable us to form 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is our clinical indicator of status. There is further conversion in the kidney by 1-alpha-hydroxylase to then give us 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D, which is the active hormone. Now, I'd like to come back to this slide and in particular, or come back to this concept of those two enzymes in, in a, a short while. I don't have time to go through this in detail, but just to make the point that for uh, what is absolutely key for vitamin D is the vitamin D receptor. There are over 200 sites for vitamin D receptors in the body, which is what makes vitamin D so important, not just from a bone point of view, but from, from other health outcomes too. 
including diabetes, your pancreatic beta cells, require vitamin D to function. And so if you are vitamin D deficient, you may very well be at an increased risk of diabetes. And what, what is so um, intriguing about the UK, of course, is that we can only make vitamin D between April and September. And the British winter is a huge, therefore, a huge challenge for us because there is no um, production of vitamin D in the skin. The World Health Organization estimates that over 2 billion people living in low to middle income countries have vitamin D deficiency. And the cost of treating vitamin D deficiency is now at scales 100 million. And those are predictions that were given by NICE last year. So to know whether you're in the, the right sunlight or not, your shadow has to be shorter than your height. So if your shadow is longer than your height, you will make no vitamin D. And that comes from a lovely paper by uh, Dr. Holloway in which he talks about the zenith angle of the sun. And when the zenith angle of the sun drops as it does in the winter, your shadows become longer. And so in the winter, your shadows will be double your height and you will therefore not make any vitamin D. There are dietary sources, vitamin D3. These are good examples of, of vitamin D3 supplements. And the D2 supplements are for mushrooms. So if I've got any mushroom lovers in the audience, your butter mushrooms are grown in the dark. They don't contain any vitamin D. But when it's a sunny day during April to September, put them on the windowsill and they'll gain some vitamin D before you, before you eat them. And there are many mushrooms that do supply vitamin D, but be careful of the ones that you choose because not all of them are safe. Now, of course... Vitamin D recommendations worldwide, there has been a number of countries who have now published their vitamin D recommendations. And where SACN sat, and it was a great privilege to work both with Professor Prentice, but also for us to be chaired by Professor Powers in that SACN recommendation, in which we set our cut point as 25 nanomoles per litre. So that new recommendation <coughs> is is advising individuals that they have to take 10 micrograms of vitamin D to avoid being below 25 nanomoles per litre. And that is, um, uh, is now been published and been in existence for over three years. And of course, what it does is represents a huge challenge to us in the United Kingdom because we would get no more than about three and a half micrograms per day in our diet. And so we set about, through uh, Food Standards Agency funding, to really look at the effect of diet and sunlight exposure on vitamin D. And what we showed in particular was our South Asian women were deficient for almost the entirety of the year. And Andrea has now gone on to look at the UK biobank um, uh, ethnic minorities, for which we have over 8,000 um, individuals, and as you can see here, there is very extensive vitamin D deficiency. It is almost universal, and these are data that are just out. Um, Andrea presented this at last month's um, FENS meeting, so it's not been yet been published, but it has been published as an abstract. And you can see that actually 10% were below the detection limit, and so it's likely that the vitamin D deficiency was much higher than what we present here. What she's also gone on to do, and this has been published, is to look at supplement use, which is um, really almost non-existent in this group, and dietary intakes to be extremely low. And so what we're now going on to do, um, through the work of Rebecca Veering, is to look at vitamin D and particular parathyroid hormone in black Afro-Caribbean, for which we have, again, very little data in the United Kingdom. And then to look at the biobank for the Black Afro-Caribbeans, and this work will be done in collaboration with both Andrea and Dr. Marcella Mendes. Now, when we look at it and we look at vitamin D, this was an idea that was put to me some years ago by this gentleman, Professor Reinhold Feith from Toronto. And what he said was that if you go up and down and you fluctuate continually for your vitamin D, that may not be very good for health. And the reason that it may not be, and he had observed several studies that had been published that had showed a detrimental association between both low and high vitamin D status. And what it may be 
And if you remember back to those enzymes that I showed you, that the above detrimental health findings could be due to the slow adaptation of those hydroxylase enzymes to fluctuating vitamin D levels. And because we had that defines cohort, we were able to look at that. This was, would be an example of somebody in our study who would be a high cycler, they would go up in the summer, and they're very much down in the winter. And this would be somebody who would be a low cycler. And so Andrea has looked at this, and what we've shown is actually there is an effect, that those, a bone effect, that those individuals who cycle the most have much worse bone uh, resorption. That's not been shown before, and of course it's only one study, and we need others to follow suit if we are to say that seasonal cycling is not good for, for health. What we're also looking at, and this is through the work of uh, uh, Dr. Sassia Wilson-Barnes, is to look at vitamin D status, not just in athletes, but also university athletes. And what she's shown in this study is that athletes and controls have tremendous vitamin D insufficiency, if we set that at 50 nanomoles per litre, and that those individuals who had higher vitamin D status actually had superior muscle power and aerobic fitness. I've also done a lot of work, which has been a tremendous honour with, in the Middle East, um, in particular with the King Abdullah Aziz University for over a decade. And what we've done is to show extensively that vitamin D deficiency is extremely low in uh, women uh, of uh, Middle Eastern origin, both in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait, and all of those samples were flown back to the UK, so we were very much measured in, uh, with Dr. Jacqueline Berry's group in Manchester. And that really made us think about what other ways could we try and help individuals. The reason that these women are so vitamin D deficient is because of their clothing style. And so to think out of the box, together with the King Abdullah Aziz University, together with the physics department at the University of Surrey, we're now working on a materials project to see if we can work with materials which do exist that allow UVB through. And if those could be used by women, it may help them with their vitamin D status in conjunction with a high vitamin D intake or a high vitamin D supplement. And so these are the group that I've had the tremendous honour of working with in the Middle East. I don't have time to show you all the data, but the bottom line is that vitamin D deficiency is a huge problem in the Middle East and remains so, and there is still no food fortification programme. We've also looked at the difference between D2 and D3. Um, and I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time, um, but just to share you with some data that actually what we've shown is that when you look at this, is that uh, it, what it was purported was that D2 was not as good as D3. And in a very large randomised control trial that we ran, we showed that actually D2 is not as good as what D3 is, and it had been purported that they were both the same. And we really challenged to that thinking. And so what we're now going on to do, and this was the work that was undertaken by Laura Trickovic and Louise Durant, and Louise is here in the audience. What we're now going on to do, and we've collected samples in our D2, D3 study, to really look at markers of cis, uh, or a systems biology approach. And so my eighth inspirational academics are both Professor Colin Smith and Professor John Mathers, because they're making us look at the data in a slightly different way with the samples that we've collected. And I can't share with you that data. It's currently in preparation going to the PNAS journal, but it really does challenge the whole thinking around the equivalency of D2 versus D3. What we've also done is to look at vitamin D supplementation in opposite latitudes through the work of Dr. Marcela Mendes, who's over with us at the moment from Brazil, in which what we did was to undertake two randomised control trials, one in the UK and one in Brazil. And what we showed was that even in a country as sunny as what Brazil was, a daily supplement of vitamin D3 at this dose still reduced uh, PTH excretion. 
and, and there was a, absolutely a bone benefit with it being at that level. And then finally, Professor Joanne Fallowfield. I've had not only the pleasure of, of planning grants with her, but undertaking them, and she is an absolute tour de force in the military. She has almost single-handedly made the military think about nutrition in a very different way, and it's a great honour. She is also here in the audience and has done, is running, has been le leading two trials for which the University of Surrey has a huge privilege of being involved in. The first one is the largest submariner study ever done, where we've looked at the vitamin D health of the, 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 those submariners, and that work is currently sitting with Surgeon General. And then the second one is to look at uh, vitamin D in Royal Marines. So every Royal Marine currently going through training is involved in the Institute of Naval Medicine-led vitamin D supplementation study that involves both us at Surrey and the University of Oxford. And if it shows a benefit, either with reducing stress fracture or upper respiratory tract infections, that may very well then lead to a change in military policy. And that is the work that, that, that Professor Fallowfield has really driven. Now, a Department of Nutritional Sciences that was really put on the map uh, by Professor Joan Millward, we were so honoured to have won the Queen's Award uh, last year for our work in nutrition and bone. And so here is all the team um, that contributed. It was no one individual, though the first paragraph was on all our protein work, and I've said to Professor Millward it was because of that that we won it. But um, we are a team, and there is no better team than these individuals, um, particularly a Reverend Professor Linda Morgan, who took over from Joe Millward to head us up for a few years. Dr Jackie Bishop, who has now been at Surrey for over 40 years of service. And then Professor Bruce Griffin and Professor Margaret. And between us, we run the Department of Nutritional Sciences, and it's a huge privilege to be the head of it. Now, the BNF Prize comes with a small financial gift, and so I've denoted that to this school, which is the King's College School in Guildford. It's in a very deprived area of Guildford. And the University of Surrey has a wonderful collaboration with this school. And through the work of our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Max Liu, we've invested, we have a University of Surrey uh, member of staff in that school. And what has happened in the last 18 months is that the school has gone from being in failing measures to good. And so the financial contribution will be really great for that school. So thank you very much indeed, British Nutrition Foundation. And then finally, I have two messages to give you. The first is this one. Of course, we must not forget, uh, last year was 100 years since uh, women got the vote, and I had the great honour of being actually up in West Westminster on that day, presenting for Sacken on the potassium salts. And there was no person, so lest we not ever forget that we don't ha didn't always have the privileges that we do now in the research that we do, particularly uh, those of us who are female. And of course, Christabel Pankhurst was absolutely key to that. And so I thought I'd finish. My William and I have our own little Christabel, who is in the audience. As Professor Schenken said, she's the most amazing figure skater. When I put this slide up, she said, Mum, you can't possibly show that. This leg should be straight and this one should be higher. And I said, sweet girl, don't worry, there won't be any British skating judges in the audience. But just for you, we practiced that on one of our early mornings. And so we managed to get it just that bit better. She is also becoming quite a horsewoman. This is at the new addition to our family, Mr. Bailey. And as you can see, she's very busy um, with her show jumping as much as she is with her ice skating. And then I cannot show one without the other. And so my second child, my eldest child, is my very precious son, Christian Lanamnu, who is also in the audience. He is the most amazing goalkeeper. He would be a phenomenal runner, but ladies and gentlemen, I can't persuade him to get onto the track. But he looks more like Mo Farah than Joe Hart. But he is a tremendous goalkeeper. 
and um, is currently the number one for the Metropolitan Police. So if there are any under-19 football managers looking for a goalkeeper <laughs> for next season, here's your man. And this picture was taken a little bit of time ago, and so I took that on Sunday. He came off the pitch looking like um, a, 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 a Christmas pudding, and I, he said, you can show that picture as long as it doesn't show my muddy face. And I leave my second message is not is to leave you with is, of course, in this world of Athena Swan, which is, of course, gender equality, the bottom line is when we look at our students and students in many other universities who are training in nutritional sciences, we've shifted the balance. And what we need to do is to make sure that we have as many males coming through as what we do on females. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your time. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. Thank you very much. Um, and um, so that you can have, she packed so much into that. Um, if you want to look at it again, um, we've been recording it. Um, I think your voice with the slides, and we're going to put it up on uh, BNF's YouTube um, channel um, as soon as we can, um, so that you can have a look at it again yourself and also share it with anybody that you want to. But thanks very much, Sue. It's brilliant. So um, that brings our proceedings today to an end. I hope you've all had a really useful um, academically day. Uh, also met some new, perhaps met some new people over lunch. Um, and you can pursue some more, perhaps some new collaborations in the future. Thank you all for attending. Um, I wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you.